the scripture reading is from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 7 to 13. It can be found on page 1029 in the Black Bibles. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never, how sh never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Christy, so much, and good morning to you. Uh, my name is Clay Holland. I am associate pastor here at Christ the King, and uh, excited to be here uh, with you this morning. I've been nervous when you know when it was going to be like my shot here on uh, the Book of Revelation, and because you know Revelation's got all this symbolism, and it's just very you know it's just like not really easily to accept uh, you know access. And I read this passage you know the other week, and it's like I was just thrilled, you know. A, a, a church to an American city um, just made me feel just made me feel a lot more at ease, you know, being able to kind of figure out what this is about, and um, it's not really about that. So um, once I figured that out, I got nervous again. So let me pray and let's ask the Lord to help us as we look into this passage. Father, help us to have an ear uh, to what the Spirit says to your churches. To what you say to our church, what do you say to us this morning, Father, impress these words on our heart and into our lives, and we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. People want to belong. Um, they want to be included. They do not want to feel alone. I just think that that is a part and parcel of what it means to be human. A week ago, last Sunday night, um, I got a call from my daughter on Monday morning. I got a call from my daughter, Emma, who lives in Austin. Uh, and, and I live vicariously, so I have a weird, I live vicariously through my children now. It's kind of like opposite, you know, world. Like they do fun stuff and then they tell me about it. Um, but she walked from her house in Austin last Sunday night with two of her roommates to Zilker Park in Austin. They went to Austin uh, City Limits uh, Festival and they saw Mumford & Sons which had been a big family favorite, you know, kind of our family for a long time. And so she was writing essentially to brag to me and to rub it in that that's where she was going. But so she and her roommates who are young and they're fun, they, they get to this concert, they get to this festival, they squeeze their way, you know, in the, in the pit in general admission all the way up to the stage and they're standing there, you know, like as sardines are getting ready to like, you know, hear this show. And there are all these people like right, squeezed in around her. And so this guy started talking to her and she started talking to him and he said, hey, how many times have you seen Mumford and Sons? And she said, twice. I saw them once in Houston uh, and then I'm seeing them here. And she said, how about you? He says, 20 times. Um, it's like this was his 20th show. And then in a moment of like Gen Z vulnerability, which I'm still trying to get a handle on, he basically started telling her part of his story. He said, he said yeah, in the last two years, I have lost 10 of my friends, either through overdose or through taking their own lives. Ten of my friends, he said. And so I've been following Mumford and Sons around, uh, listening to their concerts because 
It's in their music that I feel less alone. It's in their, it, their music just helps me is basically what he said. And Emma's like, wow, man, I'm so sorry to hear that. So, so what's your favorite song? When she asked him what his favorite song was, he pulled up his shirt and he had lyrics of Mumford & Sons tattooed on the inside of his arm that said, in these bodies we will live, in these bodies we will die, where you invest your love, you invest your life. Your lyrics to a song called Awake My Soul, which is really an awesome, it's an excellent song. But just think about that for a second. This this, this young man follows this band around, this band that doesn't know who he is, that doesn't probably know that he exists, but follows this band around the country to feel less alone. He has their words tattooed on his arm physically and, and really emotionally and symbolically these things are written on his heart, providing guidance, encouragement on how to live. And this does not just suffice for him to sit in his bedroom with his headphones on all by himself, you know, to listen to the words of this song. He needs to be with the people, needs to be with the people. They need to be all singing these words together to belong, to feel less alone, to to try to make sense of the world, to try to make sense of grief and loss. He's looking for a church and he's finding it or some semblance of it. You know, in this cultural experience, this is only human. This really is only human. Because as human beings, we want to belong. We want, we want a group of people who, 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 who march with us and help us to find hope and meaning in this world. Now, this letter to the church in Philadelphia, which is a city in modern-day Turkey, it's not actually in Pennsylvania, It was written to a small group of people who in this world and in this life did not belong. They did not belong. They were marginalized by everyone who had power and influence and authority in their city. They were excluded. They were left out. They were on their own. But importantly, this is only one of two letters in Revelation 2 and 3 where Jesus, writing these words through John, only affirms them, does not challenge them, uh, does not condemn them. He only writes words of affirmation. And so there's something to learn here. There's something to learn here from this story of exclusion to affirmation to inclusion. And those are our three points this morning. Exclusion, affirmation, and inclusion. So first, let's look at the exclusion All of the letters to the seven churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 were written to churches that existed in hostile cultural environments, deeply hostile. On the one hand, they were located in cities that were in the Roman Empire. They were in the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire in the 90s AD was very powerful. It was still on the ascendancy. It was still thriving. So these cities were smack dab in this empire whose kind of ethos and, and frankly, their political culture revolved around cultic worship, the cultic worship of a pantheon of gods and cultic worship, really, of the emperor himself who claimed to be lord and king. But here in Philadelphia, there's something else that was at play at well because the context of this passage makes it clear that this church in Philadelphia is at least partially, if not mostly or wholly, comprised of Jews who had come to recognize that the crucified and resurrected Jesus was the Messiah and Lord. They have come to faith in Christ. And because of that, they have lost their prior religious community. So they are excluded already from the cultural, you know, the, the cultic and cultural power in worship. And then they're excluded from their prior religious ex- uh, community, having been excommunicated from the synagogue, which is, uh, you, you, this becomes clear as you kind of read through um, this, this letter and the words that, that Jesus writes here. It makes sense of all the languages in verse 7 and 8 about keys and shut doors and open doors and synagogues. Now, if you'll remember, one thing that John Trapp 
has repeated over and over again. This is very important because sometimes we go to Revelation and we think that if we can turn the right knobs or put our ear to it and hear the clicks, you know, right way, we'll, we'll kind of open the door to the key to the future. It's not about that. And the way to really understand, if we're going to really understand Revelation, we have to understand the Old Testament because so much of the symbolism and so much of the uh, of what is written here harkens back to things that were written in the Old Testament. And particularly that is true in this letter to Philadelphia because of the Jewish roots of the church that was in that city. So to understand the keys that, that Jesus is talking about here, to, to understand the door that is open that Jesus talks about here, we have to go back to the Old Testament. And we find what we're looking for in the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 22. In a section of Isaiah that is concerning God removing, the Lord removing one person who had been functioning as the steward of the city of Jerusalem, and he was replacing that steward of the city of Jerusalem with another person whose name was Eliakim, and the Lord says this about Eliakim in Isaiah chapter 22. He says, and I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open, and none shall shut. And he shall shut, and none shall open. So this key, this key signifies a delegated authority over all of the affairs of the kingdom. And in Isaiah, it's talking about the gate to the city of Jerusalem. Eliakim has the only key to open and shut the gate to let somebody in the kingdom, to let somebody out of the kingdom. In Eliakim, we find a prophetic foreshadowing of Jesus. That Jesus holds the keys to the kingdom of God. Jesus has authority over the keys of the kingdom of God. Jesus opens the door and lets someone into the kingdom of God. Jesus shuts the door and bars someone entry. No earthly ruler or power or authority has that authority. It is only through Jesus that one enters God's presence And it is only Jesus who opens and closes the door. So what Jesus is saying here is this. There are people in the city of Philadelphia, and there are people in our city, and there are people in our culture who believe that they hold the keys. They either hold the keys to your inclusion uh, with respect to cultural power and inclusion, or they believe that they hold the keys to your religious inclusion. They believe they hold these keys. They believe they hold that power, but they do not. That is why here in this passage, the Lord calls those people the synagogue of Satan. Those who say that they are Jews, but are not, but lie. Now that sounds really harsh, really harsh. But what he's saying is actually this. It simply means that they were denying Jesus. That they were denying Jesus. Jesus, that's that he is the fulfillment of God's purposes for Israel. That he is the true Messiah, the promised one, the coming one, the King, the Lord, the Savior. It is a lie to deny that. It's what he says. That's the lie in verse 9. The lie in verse 9 is the denial of Jesus as the Messiah, the fulfillment of Israel. And so the sad truth was this. Those who believed that they were in and had the power to exclude, were actually out. And those that they have cast out, and believe they have kept out, are actually in. How do we know this is true? From the words of Jesus in verse 7, who introduces himself as the Holy One. Which again, if you go back to the Old Testament, nobody uses the language of the Holy One except God himself only God. It's only applied to God in the Old Testament. The true one, the one and only Messiah, the Savior, the King, the Lord. Any attempt at righteousness apart from coming to God through faith and trust in Jesus Christ is false and futile. Even if on this earth you believe you have the power to exclude. Now that's a lot. And that's only like two verses, Uh, sorry, but it's just a lot. But here's the crux. To be excluded from the seats of cultural power and religious society because you are actually being faithful to Jesus 
is not a sign that something is wrong with you and something is wrong with your faith. It may actually be a sign of faithfulness itself. The true follower of Jesus may be excluded from the seat of cultural and even political power because, like the church in Philadelphia, you refuse to bow down to the false gods of the age. Just like the Philadelphia church refused to bow down to the pagan gods that were required to be in in that, in that society. There are a million examples of temptations to do this in our day and age. One of those is simply using the weapons of this world, uh, the weapons that the Lord has bidden, forbidden to try to accomplish in the world what you want to happen or maybe even you think what God might want to happen. Lying about your neighbor is forbidden by the ninth commandment. Even if you believe your neighbor is wrong, even if you believe that your neighbor is so wrong that you feel like that they need to be removed from all credibility whatsoever, and that needs to happen by you spreading things that are not true about them, maybe personally, maybe even online, maybe passing on things that you hear online that you can't verify, but just sending it on your way. Refusing to do that in our society could get you excluded. It could put you on the outs of places that you might want to be in. Cheating on your calculus test is forbidden by the Eighth Commandment. It's stealing something that doesn't belong to you. But refusing to do that could have the consequence of exclusion. It could, in our pressure-packed world, in the pressure-packed world that our high schoolers live in, kick you out of a certain percentile that you really feel like you need to be in to fulfill your hopes and your dreams. Faithfulness could, in the cultural sense, cast you out. But it's also true that faithfulness to Jesus could get you excluded from religious society. This is a shrinking group in our, in our culture as more and more young people profess no religious adherence uh, whatsoever. But for many of us, there is still a respectable amount of religious devotion that a person can have before you become a little bit too weird, frankly, and get excluded. You know, polite religious society ultimately dichotomizes our lives. It, it, it dichotomizes our lives between a religious component of our lives and an everything else component of our lives. The religious component of our lives is what you're doing right now. You're taking care of that. You're checking that box. You know, you're, you're here. You're going to Bible study. Those things belong to God. But the dichotomy of, of religious society says everything else really belongs to me. God, it would be great if you left that stuff alone. How you conduct your business belongs to you. It does not belong to God. Now, the Bible says exactly the opposite, but this is what religious society may tell us. Uh, you know, so, so if, you, if you choose to bring God into the way that you conduct your business, that could result in exclusion for you. Who you choose to talk to, how you choose to talk to them, who you choose to talk about, how you choose to talk about them at your school, people think, well, that belongs to me. That doesn't belong to God. I don't really want God dabbling in those things because there's a lot at stake there. There's a lot of stake there with respect to my inclusion or exclusion. What you do in your social life or in your clubs, that belongs to you. I don't want God dipping his toe into those waters because if he does and I start bringing him into those places, it could result in exclusion for me. It's not hard to conceive of how exclusion really can be a normative part of the experience of a follower of Jesus in this life. I would say it really should be in many aspects. But that's the question. Is that ultimate? Is that exclusion that, we, that you may experience on this earth, that being kind of cast out for the places that you may have wanted to be in, is that, really, is that really all that there is? Are you really alone? Well, Jesus says no. That's not the whole story. That's not even the tip of the iceberg of the story. And that's where we move to affirmation. It is what the Philadelphia church did and refused to do in the midst of being excluded both culturally and religiously, that Jesus affirms in verse 8. He says this, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word 
and have not denied my name. Now, that's, there's a lot in this verse. Let's unpack this for just a second. The first thing is this. It is critical for us to understand that Jesus is not saying to this church or to you or to me that we are saved by our works. He's not saying that. He's affirming our endurance in the midst of suffering. But he is not saying, I love you because you've been faithful to me. How do we know that? It's all the way through the rest of this passage. In verse 9, he talks about people coming and bowing down at their feet and knowing that I loved you, putting the, putting the, the subject of that on, on the Lord, God being the great actor, Jesus being the great initiator of our salvation. Verse 7, Jesus says, I alone hold the keys of entrance into the presence of God, the keys to the kingdom of God. I open and no one shuts. I shut and no one opens. Verse 8, he says the same thing. So Jesus, we learn from the Bible, is both the author and the perfecter of our faith. And it's important not to get that backwards because if we get that backwards, we are, we're not believing the gospel and we're trying to earn something that we can never earn. The door in verse 8, though, often in the New Testament refers uh, to a missional opportunity. The Apostle Paul talks about opening doors all the time when he's talking about the Lord opened to me a door to go to Ephesus to preach the gospel there. The door opened, the Lord opened a, the door, the Lord closed a door for me to go here. But that's not really what it means in this context. Here, this door signifies entrance into the presence and kingdom of God. It is not through cultural power or any religious endeavor that doesn't center on Christ alone. You enter God's presence through faith and trust in Christ alone. As Jesus says himself in John chapter 6, All the Father who's given to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Who is it that he has brought to himself there in Philadelphia? This church of little power. Little power means that they're a small church, ragtag group of people. They don't really have any influence. They don't have any influence in the cultural centers of power in the city. They don't have any influence in the religious you know, uh, um, powers of the city. They've been cast out of those places. They're kind of in no man's land. That's why Jesus says, I know you have but little power. And it's worth stopping here and revisiting something that John talked about last week, actually, with respect to the contemporary church. Because is it possible that we in the contemporary church have put the cart before the horse with respect to what Jesus really wants to affirm in a church? Because for some, the church is very much focused on attaining power, on having influence, on transforming the culture, you know, all of those kinds of things. And how do we do that? Growth, you know, um, strategy, methodology, and I'm not against strategy or methodology. You have to aim at something or you'll flounder and you'll get absolutely absorbed by the world. But could it be, again, that we've put the cart before the horse, that we have taken potential results of faithfulness and we have turned them into essentially the causes of faithfulness? I say this because Jesus affirmed Philadelphia on two aspects that I think that we should be we should pay very careful attention to this morning. The first is this. You have kept my word. You have kept my word. Hard to do. Keeping God's word is is, is hard to do, both in in a culture that is antagonistic to the word of God. It's also hard to do in a religious culture that, you know, doesn't want to see the word of God lead all the way to faith and devotion in Christ. But the central and most vital mark of a true church because all of the other marks of a true church are based upon the word of God, is faithfulness to God's word as true truth. True truth. Authoritative for the life of the professing believer. All of it. The hard parts too. Keeping God's word is going to put the follower of Jesus in tension with the poles of our culture and may very well leave you feeling excluded and alone in the world. That's the first thing that is affirmed. The second is this. You have not denied my name. 
That's that, that. Now, now when, when Jesus says this in Philadelphia, this is real. This is in the 90s AD. The 90s AD persecution of the church is beginning and it is only ramping up from there. The Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, they've already been put to death for their faithfulness to, to Jesus, for not denying his name, for refusing to stop preaching the gospel when commanded to. The, the, the Apostle John, who's writing down this vision right now, is on, uh, he's on an island you know, in exile. And yet this church, facing all this potential persecution, is not denying the name of Jesus. In Philadelphia, as in the Roman Empire, if you are being persecuted for being a Christian, you could stop that persecution by saying three words. Three little words could stop all of that. You could just say, Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. All of the persecution would go away. But here he's saying, you have not denied my name. The word points us to Jesus. And Jesus alone is Lord and King. And with that affirmation of our risen Savior comes a radical inclusion. Because Jesus promises that those who walk through the open door into the kingdom of God by grace through faith, even those who are excluded in this world, even those who are persecuted, those who are made fun of, those who are denied membership in clubs and groups, those who are denied invitation to parties, all of those things, because of faithfulness to Jesus, refusal to deny his name and his claim on your life, there is inclusion that makes our temporary exclusion in this world feel like a whisper, like a leaf in the fall that is blown away by the wind. In Revelation chapter 21, Jesus, through John, paints for us a picture of the new heavens and the new earth with a city. A new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. We're not going up to heaven. The new Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven with streams of water flowing through it, with the tree of life in the middle. And there's something striking about this city. There's something, if you were coming out of a Jewish context in Philadelphia and uh, in the city of Philadelphia and you haven't gotten yet to Revelation chapter 21 and, and, and the Apostle Paul's talking about the new Jerusalem, which he is in this passage, and then he talks about a temple, a pillar in the temple. But here's something interesting. Do you know what Revelation 21 says about the temple and the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem? It says this. It's not there. It says, there is no temple in the city, for the Lord God and the Lamb are the temple. Everything that used to happen in the temple, the sacrificial service of the priests, the sacrifices, the blood of animals, all of that has been fulfilled by Jesus who sacrificed himself once and for all, the author of Hebrews says. There's no temple in the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem. Yet, weirdly, here in verse 12, Jesus says this, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven in my own new name. Obviously, he's pointing forward to what what he's going to repeat in Revelation chapter 21. But here he says that those who endure are going to become a pillar in the temple in Revelation 21. He says there is no temple. How can both of those things be true? Well, the temple here is what the temple is in Revelation 21. The triune God himself is the temple. The one granted entrance into the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and the new earth, is united to that temple, a pillar, not temporarily, but eternally. You're a pillar, a permanent, an immovable, a vital architectural feature that will not be moved, will stand forever because you are united to your Savior Jesus Christ, by faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Is that your hope this morning? You know, one thing I've learned after being a Houstonian for the past 23 years, raising all my children here, is this. We Houstonians, and I'm definitely counting myself as one of your number here, 
We Houstonians will endure hardship. We will. We will go through hard things for the joy that is set before us on the other side. We Houstonians, not only, but we Houstonians will endure fraternity pledgeship. We'll endure getting woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning and being told to drive two hours for somebody's favorite breakfast taco and going to pick up said breakfast taco, bringing it back, bringing it to that active, having him look at it and saying you got the wrong salsa and him throwing it away. We'll do that. Why? Because on the other end of that is belonging. At the other end of that is inclusion. We'll endure for the joy set before us. We'll work 100 hours a week. We'll put our friendships on hold. We'll potentially bring tension into our marriages and into our family life. Why? For the joy set before us on the other end. The reward, the better job, the deal. We'll do that. We'll sacrifice attending to our own spiritual health. We'll sacrifice our own relationships. We'll pour every ounce of energy that we have into our children. We'll bulldoze her over any obstacles that stands in their way. Even if it means that when they're gone from our house, we have no idea who we are. And we look at the person that we're married to, and we have no idea who they are. But why would we do that? Because it holds out a promise of their inclusion. That's important to us. And the things that we value, the right schools, the right job, the right neighborhood, the right clubs, we'll do that. Listen, I'm not judging these things. I've actually done all of these. All of these. I will say, though, that if I had a do-over, I'd probably get rid of that fraternity pledgeship part. Not worth it. But I'm making a point. We know how to endure. We do. We know how to endure. Man, woman, and child in this room. Business professional, homemaker, student. You know how to endure for what you believe lies on the other side of that. Could it be that sometimes our endurance is misplaced? Could it be that we're using it up for for the wrong things? Could it be that we are enduring for things that are valued by our world, but that are passing away, that are fleeting? And could that endurance, could what we are enduring for, could that be hypnotizing us? Could it be numbing us? Could it be forming us through a worldly liturgy Not to be able to recognize what is worth enduring for. For what is true and what is eternal. I think it could be. I think it could be for me. I think it could be for you. But there's wonderful news in this letter to this small, ragtag, powerless church. Because it's not up to you. It isn't up to you. It really isn't. Who did this? Who really can endure? Who can really endure all this hardship? Who was it that ultimately endured? Who endured rejection? Who stood stood while the religious people, religious society, yelled at him and said, crucify him? Who got rejected from religious society? Who, in the seat of cultural and political power, got beaten, stripped naked? Mocked, spat upon, placed a crown of thorns, nailed to a cross. Who did that? Who felt the sting even of his heavenly father turning his face away from him? Because he was absorbing all of his wrath. Who did all of that? So that by faith in him, you would never experience the rejection of your heavenly father. But ultimately, affirmation. And inclusion in his family. Jesus did that. Jesus did that for you. Now the risen Lord. Writing to that small little church in in Philadelphia. Writing to this church here in Houston. Saying look to me. Look to me. Endure for the joy that is set before you. I am experiencing it now Jesus says. Endure and experience it with me. Receive and treasure this affirmation. And rest, rest in your inclusion in his enduring kingship. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for what you endured on our behalf. For the joy that was set before you. And part of the joy that is set before you, which is amazing to even contemplate, is experiencing it with your people, with us one day. We pray, Father, that you would empower us to endure 
for the joy of being with you now and into eternity. Amen.